So if anybody wants to ask a question or make any observations, uh, they might indicate here and we'll get uh, a mic over to you. Gentlemen down here to start with, please. You might introduce yourself as well because there are hordes of students who are in Arizona who are getting into the swing of the evening. <laughs> okay, at, uh, good at, morning, at Arizona. <laughs> Uh, my name is uh, Pascal Preston. I'm from uh, our local time zone here, Dublin City University. Um, thank you very much to uh, all the speakers for three very uh, interesting um, uh, contributions. Sorry, four, four very interesting contributions. I was going to say, which one was yes, it? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Arizona time zone at that point. <laughs> um, uh, my question, I suppose, really uh, could go to uh, any of the speakers, and it's about... Um, being wary of too much obsession about new media. Because the crisis in journalism is not only or predominantly about new media. It seems to me that the crisis in the um, Western, what might call the, the modern Western model of journalism, which you know emerged around about 100 years ago at the time of the first multimedia revolution, um, that it, it gave us a certain vision of the professional role of the journalist as someone oriented, oriented to the public. We have now, with the multiple new media spaces, not only a lot more new media, but actually fewer professional journalists working with an orientation towards the public interest. In other words, filtering the news, checking sources, challenging the claims of the already powerful. And at the same time, we're finding a huge growth in the number of media professionals orientated towards what you might call promotional news, promotional information, i.e. information in the interest of the rich and the powerful, whether corporate or rich individuals. And so the real crisis of journalism seems to me is not so much the attack from new media, because we now know that all journalists being trained everywhere, in DCU as well as in Arizona, have to be trained for cross-media platforms. But the, but the question is, how are we going to get the resources um, it seems to me, anyway, one of the key questions is how to get the resources to fund and renew a new type of professional journalism that will be able to, ch that is able to challenge um, and will have the same number of, if you like, professional journalists to challenge the increasing amount of promotional information going in by partial interests into the media, sp into various media spaces. Okay, thanks. Pascal, Len, I might ask you to address that uh, first, seeing as it's you we haven't heard from for a while. Right. Well, I, first of all, I think you're a little categorical in, in some of your, um, in, what, in what you say, um, because a lot of professional journalists who are no longer working for old media news organizations are, in fact, working for new media organizations of various kinds. At least in the United States, that's true, with a lot of the nonprofits that have started. Uh, and a lot of the blogs that have started, there are bloggers that have become media organizations in themselves, for example, uh, and are doing the kind of journalism that you're talking about. A and at the same time, though, the economic model question that's implicit in what you're saying is the real question. That is to say, how long can that be sustained? Can, any, can these nonprofits survive? Uh, can the, uh, the, uh, the, the new... Uh, uh, the new commercial uh, startups of the various kinds in, in new media survive. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and that's why I'm interested in, uh, in, in, the, in the various kinds of developments of new economic models. And there's no answer yet. There's no, it definitely is not an answer yet, and there will not be a single answer. It's going to be a variety of different kinds, and we don't yet know what all of them are going to be. But that's why I think it's important, for instance, for universities to be engaged in, uh, in professional journalism uh, because they have the resources and the size and the infrastructure uh, to provide, to be one of the many players uh, in this new media world. But in terms of the right economic models, we're, we're, we're gonna have to keep experimenting and we're gonna, and it's, it's, and it's, uh, it's frightful for journalists themselves, obviously, uh, many, many of whom are no longer salaried in the traditional way. I spent 44 years as a salaried uh, reporter and editor of a single news organization, I warn my students that will not be the case for them. And so that, that, that it's the economic model is the big question, and I don't have an answer to it yet. I uh, just wonder are there any uh, other members of the panel who want to come in on that? I wonder, are, is it only economic threats, or, or are there kind of non-economic threats? It seems to be the question of, the, uh, uh, of this session, can journalism be trusted? And the answer to that, from my point of view, is yes, but only if it does its job properly. And it seems to me that there are economic, but also non-economic uh, factors making it more and more difficult uh, for journalists to do their jobs properly. Anybody want to come in on 
Well, can I just come in again on, on the sort of slightly optimistic note that, that Len has struck? I mean, one, one of the other things I did last year was to set up a, a blog which focused certainly primarily, initially, uh, on the Newsnight sagas, which Kevin has mentioned. That was the Savile Affair and, and, and the other one that, that followed. Um, and I did that based at the university using three students who were on the inter, uh, investigative journalism course and we created what became regarded as the best timeline and kind of resource base for everything you needed to know about that. And that led us inevitably to make discoveries about what had happened. And, uh, you know, the, all the blog views were fantastic. And it was, but what was really interesting I found was it was the relationship between the old media and the new media you're talking about. I got quite a lot of pickup. I mean, I, you know, my blog was being covered in the New York papers, uh, you know, on the Wall Street Journal. I got virtually no mentions in the British media. And in fact, I began to get faintly hostile calls from the British media. I remember once being called by the edit, media editor of The Guardian, Dan Sabah, uh, actually texting rather than me, saying, where did you get that from? You must tell us. As if somehow <laughs> I had a kind of responsibility to report to the old media on my findings. And I found that kind of, I thought, well, look, I'm an old lag, I can put up with that. But if I was a kind of young new player, I'd find that rather patronising that somehow I had to report in to the old media on my findings. So I think the old media's got a bit still to discover on its relationship with new media. Ezra, do you want to come in on yeah, that? Sure. Yeah, sure. I think uh, there's two parts to, or two ways to answer this question. So number one, it depends how you use it. And number two, I think we have to look at the consumption of information as well. And so rather than looking at new media as a constraint, it can be looked at as an opportunity. And it's also very important to look at how this is used outside the Western context, where the barriers to entry are a lot, lot lower, and people will be able to access this content and also contribute to that content. So you have a personalization of news where anybody can become a producer. And again, if I use the Arab Spring examples, new media became very important in getting the message out when state-controlled media or international broadcast media were slow off the mark to try to cover these events. And I would say you'd see more and more of that coming along. So it's a very different model to what we see in the West. And then there's also this, uh, maybe you can help me, this, you know, the processing power of chips doubles every two years. Is this law? Uh, Moore's law. Moore's law. So the, we have to be cognizant of the digital realities as well. So the barriers of entry, um, the cost of communications and resources are becoming lower and lower, and people are taking advantage of that. And I think the more that people use these, the more that they practice and iterate on them, it's just all for the better, I suppose. OK, thanks. <laughs> I'm going to come back to the audience in a sec, but Len, you want to Yeah, I just wanted here? to add something that occurred to me, uh, because implicit in your question was that uh, uh, new media is still being seen as a threat somehow, and that's not the case uh, for successful media organizations. Uh, you know, all of our, many of our beat reporters blog regularly. Uh, they, uh, the, they, they, they tweet regularly. They're engaged in social media, and they're receiving information from the audience all the time. Uh, and so uh, it is a much more collaborative process than it was before. It's not us just telling you something. It's you're telling us something, and we're going to work together to figure out you know, figure out what the what the uh, what the facts are. So new media is actually, I think, a part of something of an answer to your concern about uh, big powers controlling what the media does, because the public is much more brought into what we do now. Okay, um, gentleman down the back wants to come in there. Uh, hi, my name is Porik McKeown. I'm a, a public relations professional, if that's okay in this room. <laughs> and uh, I've well, we'll see. Depends what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also a member of the governing authority here in DCU. I just interested uh, Leonard going back Oops. to a, a, yes, a point. <laughs> you're fine, so. <sir. laughs> um, you made a point, I think, very early on that um, you know original credible bloggers um, are, are kind of very much at this point in time as much as a news organisation as established organisations that, that we would be familiar with, brands such as that which you worked with. I guess the question in my mind is at how do we assess or how does society define something, somebody as a credible blogger? I mean, and it, it kind of comes through in many respects all of the points that have been made here, but like, what's, the, what's the measure? And then a later point, I think it may have been you as well, and excuse me if it wasn't, um, but you made the point that you know, what matters most on the web is the, is the brand, and that's an understandable concept, I think, for all of us uh, who are, who can, but is there a connection between the credibility of the blogger and if there is a brand backing them? And in that context, is popularity a factor in credibility? And is that in itself a dangerous concept? Um. 
it's a really good question. Yeah, first of all, uh, bloggers have to create their own brands. Uh, there's something called uh, TCM in the United States, which started out as an individual blog, a kind of liberal, mostly opinion blog that has now grown into a news organization uh, that uh, an aggressive investigative reporting, anti-power uh, news organization. It's created its own brand. Everybody knows what TCM stands for. And it's built its credibility through its reporting. It began reporting during the Bush administration, and, and it also established a relationship with its audience. It has an audience of people uh, of, um, who are disproportionately lawyers and, and a variety of other public-spirited people that, that came to uh, 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 become involved with this blogger's work. And during the Bush administration, uh, uh, some of its audience discovered that in various parts of the country, U.S. attorneys, who are supposed to be nonpartisan, even though they're appointed by partisan presidents, were being fired for not being partisan enough in, in what they were doing, for not going after Democrats for election uh, violations or something like that. Uh, and and uh, so uh, TCM reported that from one, and then another said, oh, it's also happening out here in Oklahoma. And then somebody else said, oh, it's also happening out here in, in New Mexico, wherever. Uh, and it became, it became uh, a, a, a running story for them that then the rest of the media picked up. So our Washington Post reporter noticed this, and we had to begin doing our own investigation of it. It became a big story, uh, and the Bush administration had to change course as a result of it. So that built that brand for TCM. People know what TCM stands for. And other bloggers similarly build brands, like the one sitting in the, in the back of the room here uh, in, uh, in Britain. You build your own brand. Credibility is established through a track record. You can't, you can't say that you're credible. You have to, uh, and, and it's by being transparent also. Uh, 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 the new media, uh, 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 new media brands that are built, uh, ha they have to be transparent about their funding. If you're a nonprofit, you have to say who's contributing to you so that your readers can decide uh, are you being overly influenced by a certain kind of, of a person who's contributing to you. Just as when you read a newspaper, you can see what, who's advertising because it's all there in the newspaper. So transparency is important to credibility and track record. And he was just talking earlier about RTE or, or BBC. If you make a big mistake, you can be the largest news organization there is with the best possible brand there is. It can disappear in, in very quickly if you make big mistakes. Is that to say, Ezra, I wonder that like the, the, you know, the strengths of, the, of new media have to be the same as, in terms of their product, have to be the same as the strengths of, of, of old media, if I put it like that, that they, if they build them in the same way, then it's built on what we recognize as quality journalism and that it is merely the, uh, it's merely the delivery uh, of, of the product, of the journalism that is different. I think the values are essentially the same, but there's not really a one-size-fits-all answer, mm -hmm. uh, one-size-fits-all approach to answer this question, but I think I'll just bounce off what you said. It depends on uh, also numbers, so how many people are following somebody, but that's not always the most indicative thing. It's also who's following you. So you might have, let's say, 2,000 followers on Twitter, but out of those 2,000 followers, you've got government people following you. Right. And also, yes, I agree with the rule that if you fail, <laughs> fail fast, apologize, make amends, and then move on very quickly. But I, I love this line that you said that credibility is an established track record. And I think that's essentially what it is at the end of the day. But there's no really barriers to entry. And I think that line between traditional journalism and new media journalism is becoming more and more blurred. It's a reality that we have to deal with. If I can add just one thing about bloggers' brands, several of the most followed and credible bloggers on WashingtonPost.com now started out as individual bloggers themselves uh, in various spaces and, and developed such a good track record and such a following that we wanted them to work for us. And they still operate in a fairly independent journalistic way, even though they're part of the Washington Post family. Stuart? Can I just make one point? First of all, to agree with everything that Len said is, is about how bloggers build uh, brands, their own brand. But just let's sort of unpack this word credibility for a second. I mean, Peter Horrocks from BBC Global News is going to talk uh, later on. About a decade ago, I was on a body that sort of oversaw BBC World Service, and they showed us some research that showed us that they, uh, around the world, BBC was one of the world's most trusted news brands. Mm -hmm. But according to this survey, the most trusted was Chinese television. Now, kind of <laughs> <laughs> what I take away from that is... That actually, what that means is that people watching Chinese television know that it is the authoritative voice of the Chinese regime. So it has a different kind of credibility. So I think so. I think we're going to come on to later. What's wrong with partisan media? I think actually, you know, being the, the source of a partisan point of view 
is a credibility of its own kind. It has its own value uh, in the blogosphere and in new media. And therefore, we shouldn't dismiss you know, uh, these organisations as incredible. It's just that they offer a different version of credibility. That's a very good point. OK, gentlemen in the middle here, and then we'll come up the front. Thank you, Pat. David McRedmond from TV3. Um, Ezra, I was very interested in, in your presentation around, uh, and I think it, it raises an issue, I think, for, uh, for broadcasters in particular. Um, and it's this, which is uh, audiences can tend to judge stories which are national or local. It becomes very difficult for audiences to judge stories which are further away and where there is no context, and you had up in your, your slide about reporting being the facts, I think, and journalism being the context. And I'm interested, really, is, is how, how, do you, how do you all tackle this issue of reporting uh, stories from places which are not known or uh, uh, for which there is no context, and, and how do we judge them? I know that certainly since uh, Kevin came to RTE, I think RT has had a much greater focus and, uh, and should be congratulated on it on sending reporters to places uh, where typically RT wouldn't have had reporters before. Um, but for the rest of us who are resource constrained and indeed RT in places resource constrained, it can be very difficult to, uh, you, you have to rely on the global news organizations. How, 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 do, we, how do we as organizations or you as journalists uh, work your way through that to make sure you're giving something that is actually a balanced view. Yeah. Yeah. So I can speak about maybe my experience at Al Jazeera in answering this question. So as most of you are probably aware, Al Jazeera really made its reputation by covering the Middle East, the region, and then also going after stories that the mainstream press didn't go about. So looking at areas like African continent, Southeast Asia, etc., areas where I would say larger broadcasters don't really have a presence. Now, the way that we did this, especially during Arab Spring coverage and then also beyond that, and New Media facilitates this so well, and we, we used it so much, is by actually finding people on the ground who are credible. So following bloggers, activists, people on Twitter. And that's not to say that Twitter is the only social platform, but we look at what people were using, and then you make con connections with them, invite them to conferences, start to make those human connections so that when something happens, you know exactly who you go to at that time. And I think that's something that um, we should be encouraging more and more because that also makes your, uh, your content and your, the context that you make a little bit more authentic. And I don't think in this day and age there's really an excuse of not being able to do that. So it's not just about agency copy, but you can, again, I use Andy as an example, you're creating your context and finding the people who are credible on the ground who are talking about something, and there's nothing stopping you from directly getting in touch with them and, and having that kind of narrative. I think this also touches a little bit on an editorial question as well, and it's those people who are at higher levels who have to make sure that the impartiality and both sides are always captured. Kevin, let me go to you on that question uh, as well. <coughs> Hi, David. Um, I think it's a really, it's, a, it's such a valid question about all news reporting, really. Um, I mean, it's kind of struck home to me since I've been here when sometimes I see RTE reporting uh, from the UK on British stories. Um, you know, we'll send so we don't have a London Bureau at the moment, so we'll send someone over and, you know, the different reporters have different levels of sophistication they bring to the story. And I think part of it is about giving them the time and the space to talk to people and understand on the ground. I mean, but you can do that here as well, you know, just to have the time and the space to, to read copy, uh, read credible reporting from the region, as well as just look at the agency pictures and so on that are coming in. Um, you know, you know, you've got experience, good news correspondents at TV3 who do that the same way we do. So there are some correspondents who have a particular specialization and specialisms in whether it's foreign news um, or whether it's business or whatever. You know, I think <coughs> if, you have a, if you have a specialist uh, kind of starting point level of knowledge, if you like, um, and then you try and immerse yourself as much as humanly possible, it's not always, it's not always easy. Um, you know, I think that's one thing that, you know, Frankly, TV3, RTE will, it's a challenge we'll face compared when we come up against people like the BBC and Al Jazeera, who I think the BBC has 45 foreign bureaus, I don't know how many Al Jazeera have, but a, a lot and a lot of money to have people in those countries. And you know, in the end, there is 
that's why we maintain bureaus in Washington and, and Brussels, and at some point we might have one back in London if we have the money for it. Because frankly, living there, absorbing it, a country and the nuances of it, um, you know, there is, in the end, there's, there's no kind of um, better way of actually bringing a level of sophistication to the reporting. And I think, you know, look at Turkey, it's interesting. It was the same, you know, to some extent it's been the same in Egypt and so on. When you've got, you know, a very small geographical area which is full of a lot of people, that can become a sort of emblematic of an easy, you know, lazy way to report what's going on in a country when actually there's an awful lot more going on outside that square kilometre or whatever in the, in the city. And it's, it's hard to capture that if you're just taking ag agency pictures of the main event. I think it's important to try and read around it and look at different sources and so on. And how important is it for RTE, uh, or just can you talk a little bit just about your decision making process in sending people out, how important it is to have a distinctively, I mean presumably you can get the stuff from international providers, you can get the stuff uh, from the wires or whatever, but how important it is and how do you judge whether to send somebody, whether it's to Turkey or, 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 or wherever? I mean my personal view, and this, I suppose this is a slightly sort of old fashioned thing in a way, is that, you know, I do think there is nothing uh, better to lend credibility to reporting than actually being on the spot reporting it yourself. I mean, it's one of the reasons I felt it's really important that we maintain the regional offices around Ireland because, you know, if you if you have people on the spot, particularly if they're living there, um, uh, you know, you can remain in touch with the stories. You have your contacts and all that <coughs> kind of thing. So, in terms of sending out on the stories, you know, I mean, it's obviously it's a judgment of how big is the story, how much will we bring to it by being there. Um, um, and how much does it cost and how dangerous is it and you know you weigh up all those usual things but uh, <clears throat> I think if you're going to be an, a serious news provider competing you know as we now are in Ireland with Sky News, BBC News, ITV News people can access all that you know we have to do well on the big stories the big international stories as well as on obviously all the big Irish stories Okay thanks I'll go back to the audience here up the front and we'll go back down then we're stretching it a little bit on time, I understand, but we can let it go for a few minutes. Hi, uh, Laura Slattery from the Irish Times. My question is slightly re related to David's, actually, in that I was quite struck by the words you used, Ezra, on one of your slides. Um, I think it was news that requires the least effort. And I'm just wondering, the question is for all of the panel, um, what danger do you see that that a kind of philosophy, news that requires the least effort, in an age where, you know, almost everybody, uh, every media organisation uh, is strapped for cash, uh, that that will become embedded as the kind of starting point from the top down um, when journalists are being asked to cover a story. I'm going to you because you're the nearest <laughs> to me. I think this gets back essentially to the question of what is the role of media, what's the role of news organization, and again, uh, media producers and providers are in the unique position that they're shaping public opinion. And so news requiring the least effort is going to really whittle down, water down that conversation. And so a quote that I really like by Thomas Jefferson is, an informed citizenry is the bulwark of every democracy, which suggests that if you want to participate in a democratic society or by extension in any kind of civil societal debate, you have to have the information as tools, as knowledge to be able to take part in any kind of decision-making process. And if the media is giving you something which is news requires the least effort, then your conversation and hence the democratic process is going to be whittled down as well. So I think the bottom line is uh, there, there is no excuse to cover the story and to have the context with it. And I think it is also does come down to the responsibility of media in enriching that debate and giving the people the information that will allow them to make their own decisions. But of course, you have things like editorial bias that comes into it, you know, from your press TV to your CCTV to your BBC and, you know, Fox. Jefferson also said, of course, that... Uh, <laughs> Jefferson also said that if he was given the choice between government without newspapers and newspapers without government, he would choose the latter, which is uh, certainly... I don't know how it would work, but it certainly appeals to me as an idea. I'll, I'll go back down, and then we come back to the... Um, oh, if uh, I can just add... Oh, sorry, go ahead. This, this is why Don Graham sold the Washington Post to Jeff Bezos, uh, because uh, we were part of a... Uh, or still are until, like, October, I guess, part of a public corporation. Uh, which uh, you know, placed certain profit requirements on the newspaper. 
uh, as part of that public corporation, and although we're still quite large and we still engage in a lot of journalism that requires the most effort, like major investigative reporting projects and, and uh, lots of international coverage and so on, we were reaching the point in cost cutting where that might have not no longer been the case. And so Don wanted to find somebody uh, who could take it private, who uh, would own it privately with no shareholder responsibility, would not have to make a profit every year if that's necessary for investment to have to lose some money, uh, and with somebody with the same sense of mission that he and his mother and his grandfather had had for the newspaper in the, in the glory days when we had lots of money. And so that's exactly why he sold it to Jeff Bezos, and it'll be an interesting test to see if, in fact, Bezos can can maintain the resources and increase the resources that are necessary for that kind of journalism because that is the Washington Post way of journalism mm -hmm. and it's been sorely tested so far. Okay, was there another further question down there? No, okay, well look, uh, we're, we're only 15 minutes uh, behind schedule already and I know I'm eating into your coffee time. So can I on your behalf thank uh, all our panel for what was a really stimulating and interesting uh, discussion and uh, we'll see you back after the coffee break, thank you. Thank you.